Please open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. As it generally works for me, I decided ahead of time that I would teach just through the whole chapter. I mean, there's not that many verses. It's not very long. But uh, are you familiar with those uh, sponges that came out a while back? They're almost like paper thin, but you add water to it and they blow up <laughs> really big. Uh, well, that's kind of how it was for me as I began to study. I dropped those first five verses into some prayer and some living water and it just whew, <laughs> got so big that I said, okay, Lord, we'll just cover the first five verses. And then uh, next week, Lord willing, as the Lord wills, we'll finish up the book of Second Thessalonians. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but there is a growing fad out there among the many growing fads that are out there. But this one has to do with running obstacle courses. People on purpose running obstacle courses, crawling through dirt, uh, plunging down into ice cold water, scrambling over haystacks. I don't know if it is exactly my cup of tea, uh, but it's growing. Is it, is it a sport? Uh, is it fun or is it just plain nuts? Let me read to you from a recent article. In fact, the article came out a couple of days ago. And I quote, if it sounds weird, it's weirder still if you try it. One moment you're running normally on moderately muddy turf, the next you're swinging by hand from a series of greased monkey bars. <laughs> then you're running or staggering again, and then wiggling on your stomach through a narrow tunnel that's nose deep in liquid mud, then staggering again, trying to ignore the shrieks of agony from others, then shooting down a water slide into a pond so shockingly icy that you need to remind yourself to breathe again when your head emerges from the water, then trying to stagger again, and so on for mile after mile until every muscle and organ is catatonic with distress. Yet... This isn't some secret CIA black op. Instead, it may be the world's fastest growing sport. Now, I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but you can actually sign up for this on purpose. <laughs> Here in California, look it up. <laughs> you can sign up to run the Spartan race or the mud run or the adventure run, or this one sounds like a killer. It's called the zombie run just to name a few. And if you're going, uh, please let me know because I want to be there <laughs> to watch and cheer you on from the sidelines <laughs> with my cell phone with 911 already <laughs> dialed in. Why do I bring this up? Because the Apostle Paul shares with us his prayer request concerning a spiritual obstacle course. A course that he must run. Indeed, a spiritual obstacle course that all of us must run. Life itself is an obstacle course. Maybe your week was an obstacle course. And you just barely made it in here. I remember times coming to church where I was just looking for the church sign or the church building. Oh, the church is there. I just kind of fall in through the back door with my Bible, you know. That's running the obstacle course. It is an individual effort, but I believe for a church, it's a team sport. As we are out here in this world, running this obstacle course together, trying to promote the love of God and the gospel of grace. So let's get to it. As Paul begins his closing remarks to the Thessalonian church. And let's See if we can't find encouragement that will help us to have victory through the obstacle course. That's what I'm calling this. Verses 1 through 5, victory through the obstacle course. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for my brothers and sisters here, Lord, that you have brought, who have already joined in this service through prayer. And have prayed, Father, that your word would be effective. Lord, I just tag on to their already prayers. And I ask, Father, that your word would be powerful today because it is your word 
and you that we rely upon. Great is your faithfulness, O Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name and the whole church family says. Paul the Apostle writes, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And that we have and we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. Chapter 3 begins with exactly what I can relate to. The Apostle Paul asks for prayer. Now, as amazing as the Apostle Paul is, the guy seems fearless, he's bold, he has knowledge, he's, the guy has zero quit in him. So I don't know if you've ever thought of it or not, but here the Apostle Paul is asking for prayer. And I thought to myself, if the Apostle Paul needs to ask for prayer, my goodness, this Pastor Paul needs to ask for prayer. Would you pray for me? Please pray for me and for the ministry here. And Paul gives us exactly what his request is about. Look at it there in verse 1. He's asking for prayer that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you. Let me give to us from another translation, the Amplified Bible, and this might be able to help us out a bit. The Amplified Bible reads, Furthermore, brethren, do pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed on, spread rapidly, and run its course, and be glorified, extolled, and honored and triumph even as it has done with you. I want you to notice when the Apostle Paul asks for prayer, he's not asking for an easy life. Sometimes we like to do that, don't we? I have a laundry list, don't you? Lord, here's my 38 things that I'd like for you to do for me today. <laughs> and sometimes it seems as though we're praying for the finer things in life and not for the finer things in eternity. But Paul the Apostle, when he picks to pray, wow, uh, well, here's what I notice. I notice that what he's praying for is that the word of God would have free course. Another translation uh, has it free course. I, I think I kind of like that because it goes with the idea of an obstacle course. Let me tell you, the verb in the Greek that's used here gives us the picture of somebody trying to deliver precious goods through an obstacle course. Notice that nothing is better in this world than for the word of God to hit its mark. For the word of God to be clearly, properly delivered and it for, for it to be received without obstacle, without restriction, impacting upon our lives, changing our lives from the inside out. I don't know if you ever had this experience, but I have. I remember first coming to Christ and thinking to myself, wow, I get it. I had years and years of religious training. I thought pretty sure that I was a Christian. I don't think I was. I'd heard a lot. I had memorized a lot. But all of a sudden, something clicked in. And I'll tell you when it clicked in. It clicked in when I met the author of the Bible. And when I met the author of the Bible, all of a sudden I began to say, Oh, now I get it. Now I see why those things go together the way they do. Lord! And then God himself, as he has promised begins to teach us so please pray that that happens here just like Paul is praying the word of God moving swiftly without hindrance oh I pray that for us come on church family what would be better than to see the word of God
going from one person to the next, almost like a fire that's lit from one person to another, spreading from person to person unhindered. Now, if you want to know exactly what are these obstacles, Paul the Apostle not only asked for prayer, that he'd be able to run swiftly through these obstacles, he also names the obstacles. Take a look at verse 2. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. Well, let me think for a second. How might I be able to say this kindly or nicely or politically correct? Okay, I can't do it. Hey, some folks are just unreasonable. Am I right? <laughs> just plain unreasonable people in the world. And let me tell you what is unreasonable, I believe, in the thought of Paul the Apostle as he asked for this prayer. I believe, like he believed, like the Word of God believes, that it is unreasonable for a person to die in their sins when Jesus Christ has paid the price. God will forgive. Somebody says, I don't want it, or acts like they don't want it. God loves you. I don't need it. That is unreasonable. Pray that the word of God taught here would have free course, would bypass every unreasonability in people and would find its mark. Now I want you to notice that not only does he say unreasonable people, but he takes it a step further. And he also says unreasonable and evil. Wow. Some people will turn evil against the word of God. Well, what would that be? That would be when people are so aggravated and angry about God and don't want to serve him that they begin to put roadblocks in the way of God. That they begin to pass laws that limit the teaching of the word of God. That eliminate the word of God from schools and from people's lives. That's turning evil. It's evil when you actually fight against God and the purposes of God. That's evil. Not only is it unreasonable, but it's evil. I don't know, have you found some dissenters to your faith in Christ? You know what? I hope you have. Because that means that you're going the right direction. What's that old saying? Any old dead fish can float downstream. It takes a live one to swim upstream. And we, we, of all people, should be the ones to say, well, let me tell you what God says. Or, let me tell you how the Bible looks at that. Don't be afraid of the response. Paul the Apostle certainly wasn't. He even had some church folks. If you read the latter part of uh, chapters of the book of Acts, there were even churches that <laughs> didn't think much of the Apostle Paul. There were churches that did not support his ministry. Surprising though it may seem. Your rejection depending on from who may mean exactly that you are headed in the right direction so what we see here should be every believer's prayer request that the word of God may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you I don't know if you've ever prayed that prayer I know I have I've looked at people that don't know the Lord and I say Lord you, you, you gave me your word you were forgiving to me you're kind to me. You, you've showered your grace upon me. I know I don't deserve it. Lord, would you please give that person the same grace that you've given me? Please, Lord, show them the same mercy. Please reveal your word to them as you have with me. Many years ago, a group of pastors went to tour the massive metropolitan tabernacle in England. The first man they came to was at the side of the church building, he was wearing overalls and he was doing some work. So they assumed he must be the caretaker. And they asked him, sir, would you kindly show us the power plant of this huge structure? Certainly, the man replied, while leading them into the basement. As he opened the door at the end of the hallway, the pastors expected to see perhaps a mighty furnace that would heat this huge building. Instead, they saw over 200 men on their knees, praying for the upcoming evening service. The man in the overall looked at the pastors and said to them, Prayer, gentlemen, is the power plant of Metropolitan Tabernacle. 
and any effective church, it will be prayer that is the power plant of that fellowship. In order for the word of God to run swiftly, it takes prayer. Prayer becomes paramount as God wants to do a work. And the man in the overalls was none the less than none the other than the great preacher of old Charles Spurgeon. Look at verse 3. But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. Well, I tell you, that is a verse that takes a little bit to unpack. There's such, so much there in every word. But let's unpack it a little bit and see if it might help us in our own lives as we run our own obstacle course through life. But the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. All right. The Bible plainly teaches that in the last days before Christ comes back, yes, the love of many will grow cold. I know you've heard that verse before. I've quoted it here before. I took another look at it, and the word love that's used there, the love of many will grow cold, is the word agape. The agape love of many will grow cold. That verse is not speaking to the world. The world does not have agape love. That, wor that word is speaking to the church. The love of many will grow cold of people within the church family. That, that's just heartbreaking. You would think as we got closer to the return of Christ, our hearts would warm up all the more. Oh, he could come at any minute. Oh, he might be here today. Oh, I would love it if he came today. Oh, Lord, to see you high and lifted up, to see you glorified. My love should be growing. But the Bible says many, the love of many will grow cold. And I want you to know that, yes, God's judgment is going to come on a Christ-rejecting world. But here this is telling us, guys, persevere. Continue in faith. Hold on. Hold out. Because in spite of these things, it is my pleasure today to announce to you that God is faithful. <laughs> Aren't you glad that this verse doesn't read as though, well, this verse doesn't read, hey, don't worry about it because you are faithful. Yikes. <laughs> We'd all be in trouble, wouldn't we? It is God who is faithful. You can depend upon him. When we get to heaven, we're not going to see anybody pulling their suspenders out saying, let me tell you how I got here. When we get to heaven, we'll see a bunch of people who are saved by grace. We'll see people, I believe, maybe with wisps of smoke coming off of them. <laughs> Just made it, brother. Just here by the grace of God. Just a trophy of his goodness. No one could ever stand there on their own. There's only one person in heaven that's going to have the insignia faithful and true. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And believer, I don't want you to take it lightly that it says the faithful Lord will establish you. Well, that word establish just means firm footing. So let me ask, How's your firm footing in your faith these days? Because I know that God is working to establish you. Can you be blown over easy by temptations? Can you be rocked by the circumstances of life? Or do you have firm footing in the things of God and in your faith? That's what God is working to do. Let him do it. And I have to tell you, so often that comes through trials and tribulations. You got trials and tribulations in your life? Count it joy. Why? Because God is working to establish me firmly in the faith. I prayed for it. Oh God, that I could be strong in the faith. But wait a minute, here comes the storm. The storm comes because God has promised to establish you in the faith. Don't you love it when you see those brothers and sisters in Christ that some circumstance of storm comes into their life and yet they stand firm? I'm trusting God. I'm relying upon Him. Come what may, He is my Lord. And if God decides to delight in me or to show His glory through my suffering, let it come. 
that he may be glorified. I'm not in it. I'm not in this for me. I'm not in it for the world or what I can get from it. I want to see God glorified. I want to see my whole family come to Christ. I want to worship with my grandkids, Lord willing, my great grandkids. I want to be established in the faith. I don't want to always be fearing that something's going to knock me over. Oh God, establish me. And God will do that. That's why we use that term, I believe. Which sometimes you may have said it. Hey, that brother's really solid. Have you ever said that? That sister's really solid. Their faith is solid, man. That's what God has done in them. And the faithful Lord, notice this, will guard you from the evil one. I think a lot of people just fly over that in the, here in 2 Thessalonians. Don't fly over that. Listen, there's somebody who, well, yeah, I'm sure you've heard this, Satan hates you and has a horrible plan for your life. You may be sitting here today and you may realize that at one point or another, Satan had determined to take you out. And he almost did it, didn't he? Don't ever forget that. That it was the Lord of glory that stepped in then between you and Satan. It was the prayers of the saints. Maybe it was the prayers of your mom or your dad that held off the wicked one. Paul says, pray because there's an obstacle course out there. I'm trying to live for God, but things are trying to knock me over. Not to mention the evil one. Do you know that you are no match for him whatsoever? Look at originally when God created his creation. He goes, wow, this, this it was all good. <laughs> he also made an angel. Gave him a beautiful name. Right there with Gabriel. He says, you're going to be light bearer light bearer God's angel in heaven called the light bearer beautiful fantastic glorious we even find in the book of Daniel though God had sent an answer this light bearer was able to hold up the answer from coming to Daniel for 21 days he's powerful but I also believe that Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. He's no match for God. We find later in the New Testament, we're given a revelation of Michael the archangel coming into conflict with the light bearer, Lucifer, the fallen one, Satan. Michael doesn't even mess with the guy. You'd think he could, I'm sure. He doesn't even mess with them. You know what he says to the devil? The Lord rebuke you. Boom, done. You always position the Lord between you and the enemy. And you'll always be safe. It says God will guard you. When it comes to Satan and his henchmen, relax, believer. God is your bodyguard. You are indestructible until God decides to take you home. The Bible declares <coughs> that the very gates of hell cannot prevail against you. All right, believer, think about that for a moment. I don't know if you've ever been in a fight in your life. If you've ever been in a fight in your life, did somebody bring a gate? <laughs> I'm going to beat you up with this gate. That's not the picture. When the Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail against you, you know what that means? That means that you, believer, can walk right into the gates of hell, right past them, pluck somebody out of the fire by sharing the love of Jesus Christ with them. The gates won't stop you. The obstacle course of the gates of hell. We've got this brother signed, sealed, and delivered, Satan. Uh-uh. Not when the church comes in. Not when the church prays. Not when the church says God loves you. Not when the church says you can have your sins forgiven. I don't care what you've done or where you've been or what you've thought. God will forgive it all. He'll wipe it all clean. He'll send it away. Satan screams at that. The gates of hell will not prevail against you. Listen to what it says in Jude chapter 1 verse 24 and 25. Now all glory to God 
who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time. And in the presence and beyond all time. Amen. That's our God. That's our bodyguard. Satan deals with you. you just suppose you could ask him if he wants to mess with your bodyguard. God is faithful to his people. The Lord honors his word. His word is dependable. God is dependable in his person. He is completely reliable. Faith in him is never misplaced. Those who put their faith in him, those who wait on him, the Psalms tell us, are never ashamed. His promises never fail. The promises and encouragements to bring us through the obstacles of life are really profound here in that little verse 3. Look at verse 4. And we have confidence in the Lord. <laughs> okay, right off the bat, notice it says, Paul says, we don't have confidence in you. <laughs> okay, are you with me on this? Paul says, I've got confidence concerning you in the Lord. Both that you will do, both that you do and will do the things we command you. I want you to know that that command you, I looked it up because it kind of, when I first read it, it kind of seemed to come out of nowhere, especially after reading the latter part of chapter two and this introduction into chapter three. And then all of a sudden Paul says, hey, I want you to do what I command you. So I said, wow, that's an interesting word there. So what word did Paul use? I looked it up. It's a military term. It's a term that a commanding officer would give those fallen. I, this is my command for you. And I thought, boy, doesn't it seem as though Paul is taking some liberties here and speaking to this church family in such a strong way? How could he do that? Why did he do that? And the reason why is because he was not speaking on his own authority. He was speaking on the authority and the sureness of the word of God. And might I remind you that the kingdom of heaven is not a democracy. We take no polls here. <laughs> We do no voting here. It's not a democracy. Why? Because my commanding officer and your commanding officer is King Jesus. And we all bow before his leadership and his authority. Verse 5. Now may the Lord direct your heart. So I had to stop there and I thought to myself, yeah, that's about right. Uh, I need my heart directed. Do you need your heart directed? I, I was, this was several years ago, and, and uh, in fact, we were in the other building over there, and I, I was uh, thinking about such thoughts, and, and uh, I was asking the Lord, well, Lord, why can't we just like, why can't it be just like a, you ever wonder why it just can't be a one-time thing where you come into church and say, all right, God, I'll serve you. <laughs> Done deal. <laughs> Why are we so prone to wander? And why are we just, you know, unless we, unless we have our hearts directed, we're in trouble. So I remember asking the Lord about that. And then I looked in the one room that we had there. And we had uh, a bunch of toddlers in there. And, and, and I believe that the Lord spoke to me and said, because your hearts are like toddlers' hearts. You ever taken care of toddlers? How long is their attention span? <laughs> yeah, about that long. <laughs> then they're off to the next thing. And then the shiny thing. And then the thing that they didn't want, but somebody else has it, and now they want it. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that is our hearts. So you see the Sunday school teachers, then they're always directing the toddlers. Don't go over here, don't leave that alone. No, don't hit that one, and no, stop, there. just sit down here and eat your cookies. <laughs> And I realize they have to be directed. I realize that I have to be directed continually. 
And you have to be directed continually. And so we take in the word of God and we listen to the... Oh, right, so then you say, oh, well, he's commanding me. Oh, well, I have to, I have to follow these commands. You know what the first command is? What's the first command he gives there in verse 5? Direct your hearts into the love of God. <laughs> Private, get some of God's love. <laughs> you like that command? That's what's glorious about King Jesus. You empty, he'll fill you up. That's a reasonable command, I believe. A command that if we really understood it in the spiritual realm, we would understand that God's love for us is as though dying men in the desert come across a man who's giving away cool, clean water for the asking. Because this world is a desert. It cannot satisfy you. It won't satisfy you. It was never meant to satisfy you. It's a fallen world. And it is God who comes with the living water. Psalm 42 verse 1 says, As the deer pants for the water brook, so pants my soul for you, O God. Church family, walk where the Lord God flows into your heart with love. Agape love is something you cannot give away until you first get it for yourself from God. You can't give the measles to your neighbor unless you get the measles first. <laughs> and so it is with the love of God. You cannot give it away unless you first receive it. And if there's one thing that I know that you need above all other things, if there's one thing that I know that your neighbor needs above all other things, is the love of God. Oh, the love of God will change you. Oh, the love of God will give you new attitudes and insights. Maybe, uh, maybe I'm alone in this. I'll bet not, though. Because I've had something happen to me that i distasteful. Maybe you've had something distasteful or you didn't like it and it happened to you. And instead of reacting, you go to the Lord and you say, Oh, Lord. I lift up before you my heart right now, which apparently is full of crud. And I lift up that person's heart before you, and I ask, oh God, that you would bless them, Lord. I ask that you would help them, God. And then the love of God just kind of takes over. And then somebody may say, you're such a loving person. You don't know me apart from agape love then. <laughs> That's the one thing this world needs. I, I, I wish somehow that spiritually we could catch this picture of people coming into church like, uh, like big uh, water tankers backing up. And we would hear the beep, 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 beep as people come into church because they're coming here to get filled up with the love of God. Fill my tank, Lord. I lift it up. Here's my tanker, Lord. Just fill it up. What an antidote for life's obstacles that may be battering against you today. Maybe you need a fresh fill-up of God's love. So, first, he wants us in the love and then he flows from that into the patience of Christ. See that in verse 5? See, but I want to let you know that I've looked in other translations. I even looked up the, well, let me give you the word. The word translated patience literally means steadfastness, consistency, endurance, it is the characteristic of a man who is not swerved from his or her deliberate purpose and loyalty to their faith. Even in the greatest trials and sufferings, it is the one who shows endurant perseverance. So it says here, may God direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient 
endurance of Christ. Now, I'm not asking you to have patient endurance just for patient endurance sake. I'm not saying to you, hey, just tough it out, would you? Because I look at the patient endurance of Christ that I'm trying to direct my heart into. And the patient endurance of Christ that I'm trying to direct my heart into looks something like this. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. And now we sit down at the right hand of the Father. You see, Jesus' patient endurance had was attached to, was attached to, if you will, like a like an air hose or an umbilical cord that was tied to the hope of heaven. Don't endure just to endure. Endure because for the joy that is set before you, believer. This stinks. I hate it. I don't like it. It says Jesus despised the shame. Yet he endured it because he was attached to the hope of heaven for the joy that was set before him. For the joy of you all being with him. For his love for you. That's what you tie your endurance to. Well, I've called this teaching victory through the obstacle course. And here's the encouragements then that we've been given. Let me just name them to you real quick as we close. He started out with prayer. Prayer is that open communication with God. And God loves us. And he looks forward to talking to you. In fact, you could say in a sense that he went through the whole salvation process just so that he could sit and talk to you. He loves you. Now, sometimes I struggle with that. Do you struggle with that? God loves you. Yeah, I know that. See, I'd have a much, much easier time if it said, God puts up with you, Paul. <laughs> I think I could get that. <laughs> but instead, what I find out is that God has set his divine love upon you. And you get to talk to that God all the time through whatever obstacle is in your way. So Paul begins with prayer. He moves on from prayer and he says, hey, not only can you pray through the obstacle course, but I want you to know that God's faithful. He'll get you through the obstacle course. Trust in him. Great is thy faithfulness. Oh God, my father. As we heard sung today. Not only is he faithful, but he will establish you. He'll give you finally a firm footing in this crazy world. And not only will he give you a firm footing, but he'll save you, spare you, protect you, guard you from Satan himself and his henchmen. And what am I asked to do then? I am asked to obey his commands, to obey the word of God. And I am asked to direct my heart into the love of God and into the patient endurance of Christ. Aren't those lovely verses? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning, and I thank you for this church family. And Father, I pray that your word would run swiftly through the obstacle course here at Calvary Chapel Life, that you would bless us, Lord, that you would use us to spread the gospel and to spread your love, and that, Father, your love might go from person to person unhindered. We love you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name. And everybody says, Amen. Amen.